Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the TDR webinar on enforcing your rights under the Surface Transportation Act, or as we know it, the STAA. My name is Gary Sigfried. I'm a shop steward at Stockton, California, Local 439, a TDU steering committee member, and a 20-year Teamster at Martin Brower. Thanks for joining with Teamsters from across the country to get informed. TDU is about members networking together to make our union stronger. This webinar will cover our rights under the STAA to protected activity related to the trucking safety. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A to submit questions. Use the Q&A box. We will answer questions at the end. Now I'm going to turn it over to Frank Villa, local 4 630 steward at UNFI in Southern California. Hey, thanks, Gary. I'm happy to be here today and very happy to introduce my friend and the best attorney, <clears throat> DOT attorney in, in the country, Paul Taylor, is the founder of the Truck Truckers Justice Center. He has decades of experience representing truck drivers. Paul has lent his expertise to Teamster activists generously for many years. Thank you, Paul, for being a friend to working Teamsters. Now, let's get this going. All right, let's talk about who's covered on the STAA. So, freight, cargo, feeder, tank haul, some package car, and beverage. Virtually anybody who operates a commercial vehicle 10,001 pounds or more is covered. So, for those of you who uh, drive package cars, I don't know if it has a, a gross vehicle weight rating. I know they got the terms like P400 and things like that. The vehicle has to actually weigh, to be covered, the vehicle either has to be rated for 10,001 pounds or greater, or has to actually weigh it, which isn't that easy to determine, I don't think, in the case of package car drivers. The vehicle has to be operating in interstate commerce. The STAA, by its own language, says, it, it protects drivers who operating who are operating in commerce. In other words, for hire um, drivers working for a for hire carrier, whether a private carrier or whether or not a for hire carrier, um, say like UPS or um, uh, or a private carrier like Martin Brower hauling captive for McDonald's. But uh, you know, Congress has the authority under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution to regulate interstate commerce. The STA to date has been construed broadly that interstate commerce doesn't necessarily mean crossing state lines. For example, if you are working for um, Albertsons as a driver in the warehouse division, you know, you're working in warehouse and, um, you know, the potato chips might have come from the Fritos plant in Colorado goes to a warehouse and then the driver is solely operating in California. That's interstate commerce. So that, that shouldn't be any concern. Typically, the only time we would, and also if the dr trucks are operating, it, it's been the statute to date has been interpreted to cover drivers who are operating on interstate highways because they impact or state routes because that impacts uh, interstate commerce. So Congress over the years and the courts have all broadly interpreted interstate commerce. Next slide, please. And by the way, the STA also protects non-drivers. For example, if they're making complaints related to violations of DOT regulations, like the load securement is not proper, or a dispatcher even saying, I'm not going to dispatch this guy because he's out of hours. So, the SDA protects an employ pro pro prohibits an employer, which is broadly construed. For example, owner operators, when personally operating a vehicle, are protected um, from retaliating against an employee because the employee engages in one or more of the following protected activities. So, one, filing a complaint that's related to a violation of a commercial vehicle safety or security regulation or being perceived as filing a complaint. So if you complain that this truck's got an audible air leak in the brake system and, or you know I've got two bald tires, 
that is a complaint provided it's made to a supervisor. I lost a case against Roadway where a driver testified, remember Roadway? Driver testified that he had red tagged equipment to warn his fellow drivers. And I won the case at trial, it was taken away on appeal because it wasn't made, the complaint wasn't made to a supervisor. And uh, that case was called Harrison versus Roadway Express. So make sure it doesn't have to be your supervisor. It can be a safety supervisor. It can be a dispatcher as a supervisor. They dispatch you, dis you know, if they're dispatching or somebody above you on sort of on the chain of command within the company or um it doesn't even have to be exactly in your chain of command. Being a witness in a safety-related proceeding. So if you're, I had a case where uh, another roadway driver years ago was uh, provided a written statement in a grievance hearing. Uh, the grievance hearing was not his hearing. It was another co-worker's and it involved logging. And my client presented a, a statement saying that he had been asked to take a drug test and a DOT drug test, and that he was told to record the time off duty. And uh, he submitted that statement in a grievance hearing. That was being a witness in a proceeding. So if you're a witness on giving a statement, but the proceeding has to relate to a violation of commercial vehicle safety regulations. So if you're giving a statement in a grievance hearing, live or otherwise, and somehow it relates to a violation of a commercial vehicle safety regulation, Refusing to drive in violation of a commercial motor, uh, commercial vehicle safety regulation. Refusing to drive based upon a reasonable apprehension of serious injury. An accurate record, recording of on-duty time on hours of service logs. Record of duty status, IVIS, call it what you want. But basically devices that are used to record uh, hours of service, you are protected for accurate recording of on-duty time on that, um, on that, um, on whatever device they use. I had a case a number of years ago. It's called Bishop versus UPS. Tim Bishop was a feeder driver uh, working out of Earth City, Missouri. Uh, he would go to um, a meet point with a driver from Lenexa, Kansas, and he'd have to wait. And the company said, go on meal, which translates into off-duty time on a walk. And he refused to do that, didn't do it accurately recording, was accurately recording the time on duty because he was not to free the, the free to leave the, the premises. So um we're gonna wait questions at the end. I see one up. But um you know, so those are the kinds of things. When we talk about filing a complaint, it's protected if made to management. If it's reasonably perceived. You know, if you have an objectively reasonable belief in a violation, the complaint is protected even if it's not accurate. For example, I had a client who complained about an audible air leak in a turbo. And apparently he was had been trained, like most drivers, to worry about audible air leaks. And um, but the turbo did not interact with the brake system or the air suspension or anything like that. He had a reasonable belief based upon his experience and expertise that it would have violated a regulation. Okay, what do we have to prove? Okay, the employee must prove, the claimant employee in an STA case, must prove that a protected activity was a con contributing factor in adverse action taken against him. So he has to prove that by what's called a preponderance of the evidence, which means more likely than not. And though years ago it was harder to get it, uh, Bush II uh, signed a bunch of whistleblower protection laws, which made it easier to win. We just have to prove it played a part in a firing. So if you do one of those things we outlined, refuse to drive because driving breaks a commercial vehicle safety regulation, such as um one marker light out another case our firm had a few years ago is called youngerman versus um ups john youngerman is a tdu member he's been at ups forever about 40 40 years 
and he refused to take a truck, uh, hot load of freight, uh, back to make the the evening sort. And he, he, the truck had violations. There were required marker lamps out. It did was not an out of service violation, but it was a violation. So refusal to break any regulation is protected. So the contributing factor standard then came in and we used to have to prove a lot more like there was uh, closeness in time. And, um, you know, if the company simply gave a legitimate reason, we had to disprove it. Well, when the amendments came into the STA in uh, 09, we just have to prove it played a part. If it played a 1% part in, in a firing or a suspension or a warning letter, you've met the burden. The employer gets off the hook to show by clear, if they can show by clear and convincing evidence, they would have um, made the uh, termination or whatever it is in the first instance. What can you get? If you're fired, if you win, and this is all if you win you automatically get reinstated. I mean, so long as you can do the job. You know, if your arms were cut off or you went blind, you're not going to get reinstated. Back pay, uh, you're automatically entitled to if you've been fired, provided you try to mitigate your damages by looking for work. Compensatory damage for mental and emotional pain, if you can prove it. You get your attorney's fees. That's a nice part of it. Abatement of the violation, cleaning up your work record, might be posting of a decision that you've won in the, uh, I believe in the Bishop case the versus UPS, the judge ordered UPS to post it in like whatever they called it, the Midwest, upper Midwest uh, area and, and mail it to copies of every UPS employee currently employed in that, uh, that division. And then you can, can get punitive damages when necessary to punish an employer. So if I'm suing a truck a company with 10 trucks, you know, it you might get punitive damages, but if I'm suing UPS, I have gotten significant punitive damages against them because they don't seem to learn that learn their lesson. Okay, uh next next please. Okay, so let's talk about specific uh specific situations. I covered part of this. So complaints to law enforcement, yeah. You go to DOT, make sure you tell them. If you're going to go to FMCSA DOT, hey, you guys wouldn't fix this uh, audible air leak and bald tire. Uh, I'm here at the scale at uh, mile marker 224, uh, and I've reported you to FMCSA. Hey, great case. Uh, just make sure you keep documentation. Threats to enforce safety regulations. I'm going to go to DOT. I'm going to go to law enforcement. I'm going to go to the state patrol. That's protected as complaints. Testimony and grievance hearing we covered. Gathering of evidence. Uh, that could be, uh, it's a little dicey, but if legal, you uh, if they caught you tape recording to support a complaint or a safety issue or videotaping, you would be protected. But, uh, you know, it's a little risky if you're inside the building at UPS. Because I know they, I believe there's a rule not allowing recordings in. Um, complaints made to management. Anything else? Do we need to scroll that down or we're got? Oh, play. I, we already covered it. Okay. Uh, we Are we going going to stop with Frank here? Let me look at my notes there. Um, well, we'll just, uh, before we move on to Frank, uh, we'll talk about this. There is no rule that says you can't drive fatigued. There's no rule that says that you can't drive while ill. You have to be so fatigued or so ill or both as to make it unsafe to either continue driving or uh, if you're already out on the road or if you're at home. And it's very important that you convey to the company that I am fatigued because I've been on a day run for the last six months, and uh, I couldn't adjust my sleep patterns right away. The neighbor's dog was barking. Um, I uh, have severe shoulder pain. I'm going to the doctor. So just to say I'm booking off fatigue is not good enough. So 
our fatigue related refusals still protected. Uh, yes, they are. But again, it's the matter of how you communicate it. Um, if you say, uh, I'm not coming in, I'm too fatigued, not good enough, tell them why. Um, and I am going, this is the regulation up here, here on the board. And um, it's important that we keep in mind that documentation is something that's very important to do. We'll come back to it. I'm going to pass it off to Frank Via for a little bit here. Thanks, Paul. Enforcing the SCA is about putting safety first. When I feel fatigue on the road and I need to take a break, I take an extended break to take a nap. Document your extended breaks on your log. Log it as an extended break, not something else. Keep your own notes separately. The date, the time, the location of your nap break. Also, make notes of your reason for your fatigue. It's very important. At UNFI Santa Fe Springs, I have had multiple drivers out due to extended illness. The company tried to discipline them when they ran out of protected time off. Every time I grieved the discipline, under the STA, management withdrew the discipline. It's important to make sure drivers understand these protections and how to use them. As a steward, I make sure drivers know not to abuse abuse this the fatigue language. If you are legitimately too fatigued to drive safely, the STA will protect you from discipline. If you are doing it all the time, management <clears throat> can say you seem you seem to be unfit to work. We don't abuse these protections because they are valuable. That's it, Paul. Okay. Um I want to pick it up a little bit from there and give you some additional specific instances of protected activity. Can we look at the next slide, please? I may have to be back to this one. Okay, so let, let's talk about a, a couple of issues here. Okay, refusal to drive based on hours of service violations. So the hours of service violations are, it's, are, you know, there's math there in black and white. I mean, most things are black and white. Uh, if you are allowed, if you are required to remain in a state of readiness, you are on duty. So if you're at the terminal, you are off duty when you are free to pursue activities of your own choice. A line that I'd like to do is, uh, for example, um, yeah, go ahead and advance that, please. Okay. so. The things that you might want to do, if somebody is telling you, the boss is saying, go off duty, take a break. I use the analogy, which I did in Bishop versus UPS on examination of the UPS feeder division manager at uh, Earth City, Missouri. Was Mr. Bishop free to go play golf? Could he leave the premises? And if the answer is no, he could not leave the premises, he had to stay with the truck, then that is on duty, not driving time. Time in a meeting. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Vehicle inspections. The time you do your begin to be in service of the company, and you're out doing your pre-trip inspection, or you are at the dispatch desk, you are on duty, not driving. Sleeper birth time, if you're on the vehicle, there's some newer exceptions, um, but it, I don't know if any of you run sleeper team. Again, you are on duty if you're not resting in the sleeper birth or time resting up to uh, two hours in the sleeper seat immediately before or after eight hours of sleep or birth. 
you know, if you're at a receiver and you're waiting in line to get unloaded and they say, we're not going to get you, we are not uh, going to get you for three hours. You're delivering a, a full truckload. And you ask them, they tell you, you, you got to hang around. We're not going to get you unloaded. It could be two hours, could be four hours. And if you use words similar, well, am I free to go off premises and have a meal? Or may I Uber to the driving range and practice my uh, my uh, golf game? If you're not free to leave, you are definitely on duty. Uh, vehicle inspections, same situation. If you're on uh, start work at UPS, you know, from the time you log in, you get your IVIS and you're going to... Um, to the yard to find your sets and that kind of stuff, you're you're on duty. Uh, remaining with the disabled uh, vehicle, meetings with management, performing work for the employer, any work. So, for example, you book off fatigued, and they said, "I'm too, uh, I'm I'm not safe enough to operate a commercial vehicle. I didn't get any sleep," and they tell you to come in. And uh, we want you to file paper clips all day. They can do that legally. And and the STA does not protect a refusal to drive to work. Um, I'm too fatigued to drive to work. Uh, but obviously, in the complete context of it all, if you're not going to drive, they say, well, drive to work and come in and file paper clips. Um, that's not a refusal to file paper clips is not protected under the SDA uh, meetings, uh, performing any work for the employer. Just one thing to remember here. Most of you probably know this. We've got the 70 hour rule under the hours of service, 60, the 14 hour rule. The STAA only protects in the context of hours of service refusals to drive. The hours of service rules do not prohibit working at non-driving activities uh, after the 14th hour of, you, of going on duty. So th that's one thing to be aware of. Um, time to go to drug tests. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so let's talk about adverse actions. Uh, the... Um, a discharge, clearly an adverse action. A suspension, clearly. Blacklisting, if you any of you worked in the non-trucking, excuse me, non-unionized trucking, you probably know there's something known as a DAP report. That's a private company that uh, carriers use to report information on drivers. Warning letters are protected. Points for an attendant attendance policy violations may constitute an adverse action. We won one case so far in this against Albertson's case is called Raziano versus Albertson's. And in that case, an administrative law judge of the Department of Labor um, uh, held that it was an adverse action in the context of protected activity because it advanced a driver towards more serious discipline. Um, I'm looking here. Um, Next slide, please. Okay, other actions. You know, uh, this is the OSHA's regulations on the STA. We start with OSHA. Um, intimidating, threaten, restrain, coerce, blacklist. All those things listed on the slide are an adverse action. Okay, but what constitute a threat? You know, I'm going to fire your ass if you don't take that truck out. Yeah, that's that's an adverse action. How much it's caused you in damages? Probably not a lot. Probably nothing. Um, next, please. Okay. Procedure. We file with OSHA. Where we lose. Always. Uh, there's an early opt-out where we can get the case to the Department of Labor's Office of Administrative Law Judges. Uh, before that, opt out to get it. After a case sits at OSHA for 60 days, we can say, OSHA, stop your investigation, rule based on what you got. It's merely for us, it's a fact-finding place. We won't uh, ask OSHA to dismiss 
until we have a position statement from the other side. Uh, prior to that procedure, we had to wait four or five years to OSHA to rule. Um, that change came in in about 10, eight, 10 years ago where we could pull it from OSHA. And uh, I'm thinking in doing probably 1,700 STAA cases, we've won at OSHA five times. Need not fear, though. You can appeal. And you get a judge assigned, and we start over. And it goes like a regular trial, but without a jury. They're now doing it on video. And then after that, you can go to the Administrative Review Board. Think of it as an appeals court for the Department of Labor. Uh, the members are uh, appointed by the Secretary of Labor, who's appointed by the president. You can also take a case into a jury trial if you want, if there's no final decision within 210 days after filing with OSHA. I won't do that. I'm comfortable going with an administrative law judge because uh, I think they get it better than a jury would. And second of all, because I've doing been doing cases before them um, so long, there was an old line from uh, the, the musical, The Music Man, you got to know the territory, and uh, I know the territory of the Department of Labor and would prefer not to be going into United States District Courts and delaying it a long time. Next slide, please. Okay, here's some quick rules. Yeah, Make sure they know you're the whistleblower. Tell them. If you call DOT on them, tell them. Follow company policy first when possible, practical and legal. That's obvious. A recording device is a whistleblower's best friend, you know, but it's not always legal. Most states are single party consents if you're a part of the conversation. I don't know about California. I think I think it's not a I think you have to have um have to have all party consent in a private meeting. Don't lie to your employer. Okay. Um I've had drivers say call call out sick. And the company will say, did you always get, uh, did you always get, um, yeah, I was sick. I called out sick. And um, this was a UPS feeder driver out of Indianapolis. And he could, you know, it was over one incident. And um, he said, yeah, every time I called out sick, I was really sick. And then the lawyer for UPS said, uh, man, ask my guy in cross-examination. Uh, you're a member of the Tennessee Walking Horse Association. Yes, I am. And you were an officer. Yes. And you go to their annual conference, don't you? Yes. And then, and he said, when you say every time you called out sick, you were sick, weren't you? Yes. And then he showed him where the, a picture of my guy in the, uh, the magazine or newspaper, the Indiana Association of Tennessee Walking Horse Owners. Um, and uh, and then he showed him that he was signed his booked out sick that day. So don't lie to your employer. Don't give your employer a legitimate reason to fire you, you know. Because um, not, you know, if you have mixed issues of protected activity and non-protected activity, um, you might not be able to meet your burden of proof. Uh, First Amendment rights apply only in the workplace. Uh, it, it, it usually only apply to public employees, excuse me. But you have rights under the STA to speak up, build good relationships with your coworkers. You can look at this later. You can download the material uh, if you want. Next slide, please. Well, here's what we got from our law firm. Um, now, I am going to pass just the places where you can find out information on the STAA. So I think I actually ran over my time when I told said I was supposed to pass to uh, Gary, but I'm going to pass to Gary. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Frank. Thanks to everyone for being here. We're going to open up for questions in a moment. Please remember to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will answer as many of them as we can. This webinar and all TDU webinars are made possible because members like you join the TDU. TDU is a network of working teamsters sharing to make, take on our making our stronger. I got involved with the TDU because when I came a member, 
there wasn't a lot of education out there and they offer some of the best education that you can't get anywhere else. And my $50 annual union or uh, Teamster dues are money well spent. There's a link to join on the screen and a link to leave your feedback. Consider joining today and let us know what you thought of this webinar. And now let's open up for questions. May I cite STA if I'm fatigued due to factors within my control? Sure. Sure, you should. But I, I, I'm interested. I know somebody's going to weed out some of these questions. I'm not really sure what the that uh, person who chatted that question means by factors within my control. Um, you know, okay, just one thing. Keep that one up. Don't drop it, uh, Sean. Um, the um, you can cite the STA, but if you're no, if you know you're supposed to get rest. And you hang out at the local bar drinking Coke or coffee, knowing you're going out in the meeting and you're smoking cigarettes and shooting pool all night. No, you're not, you know, can, technically, are you still protected from refusing to drive? I would say yes, but a company can fire you for failing to take reasonable steps to get rest. That's why it's very important to give the information to the company as to why you are fatigued. You know, I had diarrhea all night. I got some bad food. You know, uh, the next door neighbor's dog kept me up. I mean, make sure they're legitimate, but there's people don't get too fatigued to safely drive in a vacuum. You know, something happens. I just didn't sleep well. I tossed and turned. I had back pain. I mean, those are the kind of things that um, uh, you need to be able to point to or should be able to. I mean, some companies will accept it a few times, but uh, I know you could, oh, aren't going to like this. But back when I was supervising dispatchers in the early 80s, we'd say, you know, Tony's on the sick, lame, and lazy list again. Okay. If somebody's booking off due to fatigue, you know, and it's legitimate, great. But if you put yourself in a position to, to, to be cheating the company and lying, you know, and you don't tell your attorney about the lie, too. You know, you're going to have a pissed off attorney. You know, I, I mean, I've had people who do that, you know. They, they they went to Disneyland on a day they were booking off too ill or fatigued to drive. Um, can, I, can I pass you some questions? Sure. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll see if Gary or Frank have any experience with these questions as stewards, and then, Paul, you can weigh in, too. My boss stated that STAA co only covers the equipment, but not, not calling in sick due to fatigue. What can I do about it? Is that for me? That's for whoever wants <laughs> to give it a shot. Give them a copy of the STAA, 49 CFR 31105. That's a dumb boss. As a matter of fact, almost all the regulations, the, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations, usually have an introductory section. Um, that in particularly, well, I know for sure in the Part 393, which are parts and accessories necessary for safe operation that says management, all employees who are responsible for commercial vehicle safety, including management, must be, must be trained in and comply with the regulations in this part. So if your feeder supervisor or your other than UPS is not trained in the regulations, um, they're breaking a regulation by not being trained. But uh, as you know, um, he, they're, he's just dumb or ignorant, that, that guy. Gary or Frank, do you have anything to add? I would say that a lot of the companies will claim ignorance, hoping that you won't pursue the matter. That's all I would add. You just got to have the courage to pursue it and use the knowledge that you've been given. And also what's important is to, what we talked about, you have to express why are you fatigued? You, you can't just call in fatigue, <clears throat> calling in sick. You have to express why are you fatigued? 
And it's good to have a witness, from my understanding, talking with Paul, even if it's your wife, your, your kid, or somebody when you're making that statement. Let's let's move on to another question. A driver was denied to use his extended long day short haul exemption for his breaks and lunch because he was 10 minutes away. Is that permitted? It wasn't really written as a question, but that's how I'm interpreting it. Well, the the long haul. No. I mean, he's always protected for refusing to drive while impaired due to ill fatigue. I'm not exactly sure what the what the person who asked the asked that was in the context of the hours of service. I mean that 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 protection merely is saying, not saying you can use the uh, the 16 hour rule if you're within the 150 air mile radius of the home terminal and you come back every. It doesn't say they have to let you do it. Um, I'm not exactly sure the question. If he asks it again. Um, or wants to clarify, I'm, I'm happy to address it. And we're going to be sending out a feedback form um, at the end of the webinar where everybody will have a chance to provide more detail around your questions. These are these get kind of specific and it's hard to give universal answers, but be sure to fill out the feedback form and we'll try and get you more information. How can it... How long can an employer work you past 14 hours if you are not driving? As long as they want. Sure, is that going to affect his shift? But I mean, if you are running right out of hours, you hit your uh, 70th hour in an eight-day period, right at the time you get back, they can, at least there's no STA protection. Um you know, um, they can work you on the dock. They can have you sort paper clips. I mean, the hours, it's not a violation of the hours of service rule to work you. The hours of service rule says when you may not drive. And it says other stuff too, but generally it says you can't drive past this point in your hours, whether it's the 60 hour rule in seven days or the eight, uh, 70 hour rule in eight days or the 14 hour rule or whatever it is. Our NAPS protect, can I look at one here? Or do you want to uh, funnel them all my way, Beth? Yeah, so we're funneling them your way. I promise uh, there was a question in the chat. Are NAPS protected if you're tired? Yeah. And Frank Frank Via covered this. Maybe you can say something and Frank can say something. Well, well is yeah uh, naps are refusing to drive is protected refusing to drive when you're too tired so if you're pulling over for a, a nap uh because you're too tired to continue driving then you are the actual refusal are as protected the refusal what? to drive the naps themselves are not protected the refusing to drive in violation of the ill or fatigue driver rule Okay, pass to Frank. You know, I have a really good example. You know, when, when drivers get up at 10, 11 o'clock at night to start work at one, two, three in the morning, and their first delivery isn't for three to four to five hours, and you're driving at night, believe it or not, regardless amount of sleep you get, you get tired, you get, you get sleepy. And so that's when I use my opportunity um, after three or four hours, four or five hours of driving, I pull over and I extend it five or 10 minutes because I have to find, I have to sleep. I've taken breaks and you don't get the rest that way. The only way you get a rest, if you shut your body down and, and an extra five or 10 minutes, it just keeps you more sharp. And when you're driving in the dark, whether it's the deserts and the mountains, you got to be sharp. You got to know how to make that quick turn. And, you know, because I've always wondered what would happen if something suddenly uh, came in front of me, what I react, how do I react? And because of a nap I took, and it's on record with my company, I was, I was safe, safe and able not to have a head-on collision with a vehicle that was uh, was in the middle of my street with no lights on, just right in my lane. But um, those are one of the examples that, uh, especially if you're you're driving at night, just keep notes of it. So um, there is just for informational purposes. So um, I don't know how long all you all drivers have been driving, but
but some are starting around the late 90s congress passed legislation basically and as congress always does it punts and turns something to an agency instructing what was then called the office of motor carriers and is now called the fmcsa to study the hours of service rules and after a lot of years they tried to come up with a something things like what they called the mandatory weekend and the first proposal was you had to have like 36 hours off you know instead of the uh the 34 restart but it had to encompass it was essentially what became the 36 hour restart 34 hour restart provision but it had to encompass two two consecutive periods or within that 34 hour restart that was proposed uh had to cover two periods between 11 p.m and 5 a.m and which made it i mean it made it completely unworkable i mean you, there's not enough truck stops in the, available in the country to be able to pull that consecutive so within that restart you had to have two nighttime uh periods and there was a lot of evidence that came up in the when fmcsa was doing these studies that um indicated what drivers know that essentially god made our bodies to sleep when it's dark and be awake when it's light out and there's a lot of material if you search hard for it on the internet or not even all that hard where you can find where fmcsa brought in sleep medicine experts and and their testimony is that the sleepiest we get is going to be right before sunrise and it's probably something you drivers all know and they will say it you know and it says there there's two periods of uh medicine talks about two periods where uh, in every day circadian it's called circadian rhythm which means a uh, latin term basically for uh a circle where we have high periods of alertness and high periods of sleepiness because that's in our body clock is reset by the sun and we release melatonin now i know that it's probably it's above my pay grade but i did enough to read about sleep medicine and you may be able to use some of the evidence at a grievance area i mean it's probably pretty hard to sleep at noon and even in those fmcsa studies the agency found that uh through the sleep medicine which it relied on to change the hours of service rules that um, even somebody who works consistently night shift work when they go on vacation or get off that they will invariably change their sleep back pattern back to what a guy like me gets to have because i'm not a truck driver so there may be some chance to you you know look to it and the best thing is not to have an sta case and get it resolved at the grievance hearing but it may be some helpful information for you and one other resource i read a number of years ago a book called the promise of sleep and it was writ written by a doctor named william dement not demented but dement and he was he was studied under the doctor who discovered REM sleep. And it's a real easy read, The Promise of Sleep. Okay, so we, do we got another another we question? We do. So we we actually got some clarification on a question that was asked earlier. A driver was denied to use his extended long day short haul exemption for his breaks and lunch because he was 10 minutes away. He was told he can't use his 16-hour day to take his brakes out on the road out on the road they told him to drive to the yard to take his brakes to avoid using a 16 hour day that doesn't make sense why the company would even want that to do that um it seems crazy i mean are they essentially telling him to drive while impaired due to fatigue and you know keep going and then to avoid using a 16 hour day i don't know why they would care if he used a 16 hour day i'm and still I, not sure I'm not, I have it, gary do you you have something in mind uh, so oftentimes these companies that they cost so many dollars per mile to run the trucks and they need those drivers to run as many hours as possible so if they think they're going to give that guy 
another long day, a big day during the week to preserve that big day. They want him to get back to the yard to take his lunches and breaks in the yard. So he preserves that big day for another. Uh, Well, it's a business reason. I mean, can they prevent him from doing it? No, the hours of service rules provide what is legal or what is basically it restricts driving beyond a certain period. I I wouldn't say that the company, if they don't want him to use it, I mean, and the driver needs to, there's, there's, if the driver is refusing to use that 16 hour day, I don't see where the company would be. Or if he's told not to use it, I do not see where the company is at fault and trying for business reasons to make it happen. Um, I guess I'm not really sure I understand. You know, if 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 it won't violate the hours, it, in the context of the STAA, if a dispatch will not violate a regulation, the company's free to do whatever they want under that. Okay. Oh, you know, Gar- well, maybe Gary or Frank might have something to add on yeah. uh, where to check your contract for protections against uh, abuse of break times or excessive overtime or ways to combat that with the grievance procedure. Well, based on what we're being told, if he's 10 minutes from the yard, he was entitled to that break for every four hours or major portion thereof, the way it works. He's well past his time. He's entitled to that break. If he's fatigued and it's unsafe for him to continue, he should pull over and take that break and make it very clear to the employer, I'm too fatigued to continue. I need to take my 10-minute break, and then I'll be in promptly. If he has to use that big day, then that's the consequences of being safe. We have another another question on... The 16 hour rule is the 16 hour rule just for getting back safe because our company is foods and wants us to make, use it to make deliveries. Uh, no, I mean, it, it isn't just for that. that. I mean, the rule just merely says under the short haul exemption that, you know, if you return to the work reporting location within um, 12 hours, uh, Excuse me, if you don't go outside 150 air mile radius of your work reporting location, you you get that many, you get two more hours available if you're under that short haul exemption. Does anybody want to talk about bad weather cases? That's one topic I forgot to cover. Sure, I'll, I'll bring it up. So we recently had a driver who very inexperienced in the snow, bad weather. He had just barely been trained to put on chains. And as some of us know, in California, we recently had a blizzard. Um, the driver didn't understand his STAA protections to know that for his experience level, that was unsafe. He probably shouldn't go. And, and he took the route. Um, companies shouldn't have sent him out there. He ended up getting stuck in the snow for 30 hours in 16 degree weather before, and they weren't going to pick him up. It took a union business agent to overrule the company working with one of my other stewards to get that driver picked up. Um, Had he known his STAA rights, he could have said, I don't have the experience to be driving in a blizzard. Maybe learning in the snow and getting trained, building that experience to that level, but not, you know, sending him straight out in a blizzard. Well, refusing refusing to drive... Um, the regulations 49 CFR 392.14 is it says something like you know, um, drivers shall reduce speed due to condi- conditions which make driving hazardous, such as, such as snow, wind, rain, smoke I can't remember what else, ice and shall reduce speed. And it says, if conditions become sufficiently dangerous, the driver shall terminate operations. So uh, refusing to drive a commercial vehicle because of bad weather is protected under the STAA. Refusing to drive to work 
is not protected under the STA. If you can't get there, you can't get there. And uh, one of that's where it comes in. If you're calling off saying, I see bad weather is rolling in next week. I'm not going to work next week. Uh, that's not protected as a refusal to drive. So it's good to, you know, be able to say, hey, boss, I was watching the Weather Channel, the local news. I looked online, uh, you know, um, the bad weather is starting now. I'm heading west. And uh, the state DOT website has recommended no commercial vehicle operations on uh, I-10 or whatever it is. That would be a protected weather related refusal but refusing to go out because it's raining and no experience probably is not protected refusing to drive in a really bad storm with no bad weather experience you know the the courts are going to take or the department of labor judges are going to take into consideration the experience of a driver i mean we had the in, in incident in colorado before where the driver ran off the ramp and or he took out he smoked his brakes because he hadn't driven before so he didn't know how to uh, use the retardation horsepower of the vehicle. Remember, it was a carrier out of Texas, and they took out about eight people. The driver did. I mean, that that's one thing, you know. I mean, if it's just a little rain, and I don't, I don't drive in rain. A blanket refusal, for example. I had one later, uh, and not that long ago, and a guy said, I don't drive when it's snowing out. That's not protected. But to say, I'm not going to drive tonight because it's a heavy snow and here's the forecast, you know, and be able to respectfully give that information to a boss and that refusal would be protected. Is the company, is the company required to train on how to put snow chains on? Not under FMCSR. I'm not sure. I don't think so under Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. Um, that might be a good question for Gary or Frank about yeah. where to look at your contract about what your employer is required to do on training. Frank, well, that? there there has to be some type of issue we have to look into because to put your chains on a truck, it takes you have to have experience. You can't just give somebody uh, some chains and have them put the truck the chains on because you need a lock to care you need a lock to once you put them on and then you travel a few miles from my understanding so i'm not i'm not real familiar with chains you have to tighten and so there has to be some protection because if a guy just goes there and doesn't put the chains on properly and has an accident um who would be liable <clears throat> So a lot of these questions, again, are going to be dependent on your contract language and past practices in your area. And a lot of these questions, too, even if they can't be resolved by a, a magic wand in the STAA or a grievance, there are issues that you can involve other people in enforcing in your workplace. Um, that's what TDU is about. We're about giving members resources to enforce your rights, enforce your contract, and bring members together. You can contact TDU through the feedback form that's going to go out by text. We can also put it in the chat for you. You can visit our website. We're coming up on an hour. We're going to take a couple more questions. If I go off duty at 1700, but they work me in the, the warehouse until 20, when does my 10 hour restart set? Reset start, excuse me. I'm sorry. Could you run the question uh, again? Yeah. If I go off duty at 1,700 hours, okay. but they work me in the warehouse until 20 hours, when yeah. does my 10-hour reset start? 20 hours, 8 p.m. It has to, the 10-hour the break, with some exceptions on split sleeper birth time, requires 10 uninterrupted hours off duty you can split sleeper birth time i believe in eight and two or seven and or three segments when you're on the road but uh you know if you're working i mean the fact that you're not driving but you're performing other activities for the employer um that that time of those other activities is not 10 hours is not counted as off duty time 
Right. He should be logging that time, those three hours in the warehouse working. He should be logging that as on duty, not driving. Correct. When calling in sick, do you recommend us sending the supervisor a text message specifying the reason using the STAA? Uh, I don't know that they have to cite the STAA. I mean, that's not necessary. Um, and I wouldn't say do it by text. I mean, do it with documentation. Use the normal method of communication. And then if it's a phone call, do it and then follow up with an email. As I just told you, Joe, I'm not reporting to work today. I, you know, I can't drive a commercial vehicle safely today. I didn't sleep well or I'm throwing up or whatever that is. Um, what was the balance of the question? Or did I answer it entirely? Frank, maybe you have something to add since this is something you've trained people how to do as a steward. I, I didn't I didn't get I didn't get the question. When, when people uh, want to call out fatigued, um, should they specify that they're using the STAA or how do you recommend they enforce these rights in their in their day to day? Calling out sick or fatigued? Well calling out sick <clears throat> um Company should know, but you could bring it up STA. I mean, they know now at my company, but you could bring it up STA. And but it does say that you can give a reason why you're you know why you're too sick to drive safely. Um it does it, it's not required. It's not required, but it's 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 not forbidden. Yeah, the one thing you don't the one thing you don't want to do is just let me just know. I can't drive today, I'm fatigued. As I said earlier, the ill or fatigued driver rule does not say you can't drive while fatigued or while ill. It's got to rise to the level where you're so ill or so fatigued as to make operation of a commercial vehicle unsafe. And I know in the Raziano versus Albertson's case, uh, two of the drivers, two of the four we represented, um, said too fatigued to safely drive uh, 49 CFR 392.3. That's what they put down. And that works too. That's the other fatigue driver rule. But too, too fatigued or too ill to safely drive. Okay. It's, I mean, it's just better. I, you could do more and explain why. And, and, and like, like, you know, we, we push and talking and, and talking with stewards we don't want drivers to abuse this because it's a benefit that it helps us tremendously. But if you're fatigued, there's a reason why you're fatigued and you, and it, and you and keep notes of it. If you're sick, it's easy to prove you're sick. You go to the doctor or you, you let the company know, uh, um, you know, what's wrong with you. Um, and, and if it's personal, you let them know at a later time, but uh, you could just, you know, push the issue. You're just too, too, too fatigued or too sick to drive safely. Okay, let's take let's try to take a couple more. Does the SCAA cover local ready mix interstate companies? Yes. If they're using the interstate system at all, for sure. Okay. So I mean, it, it, where we're going to maybe not run into people is uh, run into people who are maybe sand and gravel haulers or Fry, you know, I, I've represented some frack drivers who haul frack water or frack wastewater, things like that, when they're on private roads. Let's, we can take a couple more. Cisco has their drivers continue working and has another driver pick them up. How long can an employer force you? Well, this was already answered. It's work past your 14th hour. There is a question came up earlier, Paul, about... Um, Team drivers that end up both having to work when one of them is supposed to be sleeping. Yeah, that that's cheating the system. Uh, I ran into it in a case. Well, let's me just leave the name of the company uh, out of it. But a lot of calls I get are from people who are doing routes, like for um, gas stations, which I guess are just convenience stores now. And theoretically, the route can be done 
uh, at least on paper, um, one guy driving one in the bunk. But what drivers do to meet their allowances that the company gives them. I mean, there's so much on there with so many shops, you need both people to deliver uh, and uh, to get all the product off to actually make the time. And one driver lies on his logs and commits a felony by falsifying his logs to say, well, they boot though, to say one was in the sleeper berth while the other one was unloading all of it. So, um, you know, I don't remember exactly the question, but I think I did answer it. <laughs> you report to work, here's another one. You report to work at your start time of 1800 and a tractor trailer ban goes into effect at 12 a.m. What are your rights if you're in the middle of your leg to your next stop? Uh, so that would be a local ban. So what they got in the yeah. LA metro area, you can't drive trucks at certain times. Uh, better pull over and quit driving. Is, is, I would say that that's, you know, the law protects or refuse to violate any federal or state commercial vehicle safety regulation. So it's got to be a safety regulation. Like refusing to drive without a plate is not protected under the STA or an IFTA stick or whatever. I would say at that point, uh, you know, if it's going to violate, you can anticipate out a certain length of period. Hey, I can't get this done. I'm coming back to the terminal. Oh, I want to start, try to work cooperatively. Look, the, the band's going to come in and I'm going to be driving. I don't want to be shut down in the middle of the highway. It will break the, 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 whatever the ban is that they have in California or Los Angeles County or whatever county, it's a Riverside. Um, if it's going to break a safety regulation, and I'd say that that ban is because of traffic, um, refuse to drive it, you know, and, and best to not get into it first, you know. I mean, what are you going to do, pull over? You know, I guess you could pull over and probably find a safe haven of parking. take another one if if i have 40 hours of available sick time maybe frank or gary could take this one probably if i have 40 hours of available sick time but choose to call off sick due to sickness can the employer take my sick time under the staa i think they can they have you have benefit time they're going to use it yeah, I, I, from understanding, the SDA protects you from being disciplined. So if you got if you got sick, uh, protected time available and they use it, uh, I, I believe they can. Uh, SDA only protects you from being disciplined. They're not going to discipline if you have protected sick time to take off. That's that's how I understand. But you know what, Beth, I wanted to ask ask a question also, since um, so I don't forget, I'll forget to bring it up. You know, and uh, Paul has helped me win a few grief a few grievances on this situation what happened was when a driver punches in before his 10 hours up by a few minutes or so uh because he just wasn't accurate on his 10 hours off the company tried to write the driver up for violating his 10 hours but speaking with paul taylor we were able to find out that it, it was a mistake and as long as he had you know he was just punched in he realized it once he punched in um we were able to to prove that it was a mistake it wasn't actually a dot violation and what my question is to paul could you reset could a driver reset his time like uh reset his time from that time he punched in because once you punch in it usually goes to your logs so if you didn't if it was a mistake and you didn't uh, do any uh work uh could you reset your your hours so you get your 10 hours uh sure well as long as you is it a dot violation so, so I mean, if the if if the driver shows up, and you're saying he he shows up and and uh, logs on duty at nine hours and fifty seven uh, minutes. Um, if he realizes his mistake that and and he was still off duty during those three minutes, he just you know he just logged in early, but he's free to pursue his activities of his own choice, if it's not the start work time, you can reset it. You can reset and edit logs. There's it has to be an edit function on the electronic logs for the driver only. And you can reset it to reflect what's true. 
You hit so the wrong got, button. If, if, if he's reporting his re start work times 10 a.m. and he reports at 9.57 and logs in, nine hours and 57 minutes, okay, of, of off-duty time, um, he can reset it. So you're, saying just, it uh, so you're saying just if it's only a few minutes, it can't, if it's 10, 15, or 20 minutes, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that? If you're not remaining, if you're not off duty, if you're still free to pursue activities of your own chosen, choosing, sure. You want to get there an hour early. You know, you want right. to get there after nine hours. The 10 hours doesn't say you got to rest. So you got to be off duty. So if you get want to get there, uh, you know, early before clocking in and have coffee with your buddies, you're free to do that if the if it doesn't violate company policy to, to have coffee in the break room before the start of your shift. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if we've got a couple more questions real quick. Can a company force you to return to work in exactly 10 hours for your 10 hour reset with no regard to driving home, et cetera? If it takes me an hour to drive home and an hour to drive back, how do I account for the 10 hours? Uh, under the law, they can do that. Uh, people choose to where live where they live. Now it could affect you on going to work say you live 50 miles from work i know you wouldn't probably that'd take you eight hours in california to drive to work but not here in arizona where i live you know um if you uh, get fatigued because you're not you're living i know drivers who live 100 miles away from the terminal they're just not union drivers they're truckload drivers and they get home every six weeks or three weeks or whatever it is uh you know so, uh, yeah, they can, that, if they require you to come in exactly at your 10 and you're not too fatigued or ill to safely drive, they can do that. And it, again, if they, you and you have 10 hours uninterrupted time off duty, you're not on duty when you're driving to work. Now, they might, if you're too ill or fatigued to safely drive because you live too far from work and you refuse to drive, technically that's protected. But the company can essentially get to the point where they say, well, you're not capable of doing your job because of where you live. You live too far away, and we only want people work. I'm I'm talking without a contract. And so if we only want people who live within 40 minutes of the terminal, um, you know, you can't work for us. It's sort of just one thing when we were talking about ill or fatigue. I, um, you know, certain things aren't going to be protected. In, on an illness, it, you know, and the, the regulation says so impaired due to ill fatigue or some other cause, which could be an injury. But I mean, you're not going to be protected if you can't meet the essential qualifications of the job on a regular basis. I can't come to work today. I did something stupid. I was plowing snow, turned off the snowblower, but the blades were still turning. I lost my hand. I can't work today because I'm missing a hand. I'm using an extreme to illustrate a point. At some point, there could be a problem if you can't meet the essential qualifications of the job. For example, if you have to, you know, if you are uh, somebody who can't sleep during the day and you say, I can't sleep during the day, okay? If your job requires it as a matter, as an essential qualification of the job for you to sleep during the day and work at night, that's not an excuse that I can't sleep during the day. Know you know, Paul, I would, I would yeah. think that if if it does if it's not happening every day where that driver is being required to come exactly ten hours, and and he's had a hard day and the company's having an issue and they need him there within ten hours, I mean, I I, I believe if fatigue sets in, if it's not a regular situation and if fatigue sets in, a, a driver should be able to use that or the company can work with them, be reasonable about it. I, I would think, but um, it, it, I I believe that he could use fatigue. I agree. I I agree in that context. But ultimately, if you're living so far away that you just simply can't ever show up or can't usually show up and be prepared to drive whenever maybe your, your sleep schedule gets inverted or something like that. So you're right. I mean, the fatigue refusal itself is always protected. I mean, if you're really too fatigued to safely drive, 
But there could be circumstances where they could say, well, we're not firing you due to ill or refusing to drive due to illness or fatigue. You just simply can't adapt. It could be like, for example, a lifting restriction. So anyway. So we're about a quarter, about a quarter after the hour. Um, I wanted to just put the resources page back up on the screen for a second um, and invite people to take down notes on any of this stuff. We'll have recordings available. Um, we'll have recordings available of this workshop and uh, the slides available also. Um, they'll get emailed out to people who are registered for the webinar. Um, text messages just went out a couple minutes ago. Um, please fill out the feedback form, consider joining. And let's see if we wanna take one more question to wrap it up. Um, we have personal days to use, but when we apply and get, we get denied a majority of the time, we call out sick and we call out to use our sick day. Can the company, can the company retaliate? They cannot, well, the, the law prohibits retaliation if the person has engaged in a legally protected work refusal. If you're really too ill or fatigued to safely operate a commercial vehicle, then you are protected. So I'm I'm not sure I understand it exactly, but uh, maybe Frank or Gary do. Well, if you call out sick and you show up on TV at the Giants game, that's going to be a problem. If you're calling, that's using STAA. If you're calling out sick under your benefits because your wife is sick and they see you at the grocery store, that's different. Using a benefit day, your wife is sick. Um, even with STAA, if you call out sick because your wife is sick, again, you wouldn't be at the Giants game. You'd be at home taking care of your wife. And that's why you didn't get rest or whatever the case may be. Just don't make it a habit, or I would say don't do it at all calling out under STAA and going to the Giants game, um, going to NASCAR race, whatever, because you're putting yourself in jeopardy. You know, I let I let drivers know that if they're sick, you know, it, it, they need a day off and they're in some type of trouble. You know, uh, we have a lot of these walk-in clinics. Go in there and let them know how you're feeling to get a doctor's note. That will help you very, that will help you, especially if you get a doctor's note the day you call in sick. Yeah, doctor's notes are good. Thank you so much to our panelists, especially to Paul Taylor um, for all of the time that he's spent working with members trying to enforce their rights, not to mention our non-union, uh, hopefully soon to be Teamster brothers and sisters to enforce their rights. Um, fill out the feedback form, consider joining PDU and um, Thanks, everybody, for being on. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Paul. You're, hey, everyone. you're welcome.